Hi, I'm Steve McGill of the Hurdle Magazine and HurdlesFirst.com and one of the features of our revamp website that we revamped uh, earlier this month um, in September will be going to do a series of little hurdle talks, we'll call them, little talks about hurdle related topics and whatnot um, as they come to my mind. Um, so this will be the first one of those and I wanted to start by talking about my own experiences as a hurdler and how I got involved in the hurdles to such a passionate degree, I guess you could say. Um, because as someone who has only run a personal best of 1563 in the 110s and 58 flat in the um, 400 hurdles, the question comes up, you know, why am I so involved in hurdles still in my mid 40s? Um, well, the, the answer is not too complicated once you hear the story that I'm about to tell and you'll see um, why even at this old age, if you will, um, the hurdles are still still the forefront of my life. Um, here's a story. When I was a senior in high school, uh, actually it's a story kind of starts my junior year, um, I was going to a private school in suburban Philadelphia. Um, and I was mostly a basketball player. That was my sport of preference at first. That's the sport I grew up on, and that's the sport that I was playing, trying to get to the varsity level and whatnot. Um, I didn't start hurling until my sophomore year, and I, I liked it, but it was still looked upon as something to do in the spring as sort of a break from basketball. Um, so my junior year, we had an, uh, our head coach hire an assistant, and the assistant wanted to put an indoor program in place. This has been the first year of that. We didn't have an indoor program before. And so I'm like, ooh, I would love to do that. But I couldn't because I was playing basketball. And so I ultimately I, I quit basketball so I could run track year round. Um, so in the, junior, in the spring of my junior year, um, about March, I guess, early in the outdoor season, I started feeling very tired a lot. And um, it was difficult finishing workouts. And it was very difficult finishing the 300 hurdle race. Um, I would get so tired in the last straightaway that it was like debilitating. <laughs> okay, um, as as the weeks and months wore on, I guess March into April or whatnot, um, it, it got worse. Before I would get tired at the very end of the race. By April, I was getting tired after hurdle two, hurdle three. <laughs> so what I did was I asked my coach if I could stop doing the three hundreds and just do the one tens and pick up the 300s next year if I get a chance to get myself back in shape. And he said that would be a good idea because he saw that I was doing a lot worse. He couldn't, he couldn't explain why either. So um, ultimately my junior year, I only did, did the 110s and did, did well in those, well enough. And um, I think I got fourth in our, in our league championship. We didn't go to a state meet because we were a private school. And our private school conference didn't have a state meet to go to back then. So anyway, um, I vowed over the summer that I was going to get myself in shape. So I, was, I said, I'm going to run three miles every day, word up. Um, and so I started off with three miles. You know, I would leave my, my house and go about a mile and a half down the road, it's kind of hilly and whatnot, and then I come, come a mile and a half back. And um, as the summer wore on, three miles became two and a half um, because I would get too tired. Um, two and a half would become two. <laughs> Uh, two would become one and a half, and ultimately one and a half became one. By the end of the summer, I was able to do one mile without stopping. Um, and I rational, rationalized my way through it. I said, you know, it's so hot, it's so humid. I'm not a distance runner anyway. I'm a hurdler. This is crap, you know. Um, my coach let me take two hurdles home, and I had two hurdles that I would go over and over again uh, in the backyard that summer. I wore the grass out. <laughs> Uh, going over the, those two hurdles over and over again. Because that workout, you know, you go over two hurdles, you can rest. So I could do a lot more of that as opposed to the distance stuff. Um, meanwhile, other symptoms started to appear. I would get these unexplainable bruises. Sometimes on my feet, you know, where I tied my shoes. And sometimes I'd get them on my arm. i see the big red splotch on my arm. Like, what the heck is that doing there? I didn't remember running into anybody or hitting anybody. Or anybody hitting me. Um, but it would go away. So I was like, oh, okay, that was weird, you know. Um, and other symptom that started showing up is I would get this really weird 
kind of windy sound in my ears, kind of like whoosh, 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 sound in my ears. And I would turn my head this, this way or something and it would go away. So I'd be walking around with that kind of like trying to find the right angle so that noise would go away. Uh, it was crazy. Um, and so I tried to go off across the country <laughs> because I figured that if I ran with teammates that would be easier than running by myself. Uh, but that didn't work at all. Uh, I think we had to run about a mile and a half to where, you know, from uh, the track to the uh, woods where practice would start. And I was dead tired by the time we got to the woods. We hadn't even started practice yet. So my first day was my last day across the country. Um, so I started doing workouts on my own on the track and I could do some shorter sprints and stuff like that and set my two hurdles up like I did at home. Um, I remember one day my coach saw me doing that, you know, hurdling, and he was like, he got real mad at me, like, we doing hurdling this, this early, you should be, should be building your base, and he grabbed the hurdles and took them off and put them back in his shed, <laughs> and that was kind of a, a low moment for me. Um, so, I think it was in October of my senior year, it would just be 1983, my senior year of high school, um, I was trying to just jog a warm-up lap and I had to stop about three quarters away around the track and walk the rest. And I walked off the track that day and I said, I'm not doing any more workouts until I figure out what the heck is wrong with me. Because up to that point, I was assuming, you know, I got to eat right, you know, with my diet, I got to get in the weight room, I got to, you know, get more endurance, you know. But um, I think the next day after that, I uh, was going up to the second floor for one of my classes and I had to literally stop in the middle on the way up, catch my breath, and then start again. And then I remember thinking, man, I would love to just lay down here on these steps and not wake up. That's how tired I was. Um, so eventually I asked my mom if I could, you know, if she could take me to the doctor, um, set up an appointment with the doctor and get, get a blood test done. So um, she took me to the local hospital in Media, Pennsylvania, about, you know, 25 minutes outside of, uh, of Philadelphia. And she took me to my dad's doctor at um, Riddle Memorial Hospital in, um, in Media. And they found that my blood counts were low, so they wanted to keep me for the weekend. And I was, I'm thinking, cool, you know, I get to chill a little bit, and I have a reason that I'm not being able to finish these workouts and stuff, the reason I'm getting so tired and everything. I'm thinking, boom, boom, pow, I'll be back on the track in, you know, in a week or so, once they give me some medicine and I'll be all right. <laughs> Um, so the weekend ended and the doctor came back and told my parents and myself that they couldn't treat what I had, that they would have to, I would have to go to a different hospital, either Hahnemann Hospital in Philadelphia or Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. I'm like, what do you mean you can't treat what I have? What do I have? <laughs> you know? Um, and I definitely didn't want to go to Children's Hospital. I was 17 years old. I don't want to go to a hospital with a bunch of little kids. But, you know, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has a great reputation as one of the best hospitals in the, in the, in the world. Uh, pediatric wise and um, my parents wanted to take me there so we went there. Um, there my doctor, Dr. Schwartz, Dr. Elias Schwartz is his name, um, told me and my parents that I had aplastic anemia. Um, at the time I was like okay great, <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, but he explained that aplastic anemia is a very rare blood disease. I don't think it's as rare now as it was when I had it but still. Um, Aplastic anemia is basically as much of a death sentence as a leukemia or any other type of uh, blood illness. Um, what happens is your bone marrow, which produces blood cells, stops functioning. And so all your blood cell counts go down. Uh, the red cell count is the main one because that's why I was feeling so tired all the time. I had no red cells. <laughs> you know, my red cell count was down to four, and normal is like 16 for someone my age, you know, 17 years old. Uh, my platelet cells, which prevent bru bruising and bleeding, were very low, which explained the bruises that I was having, and my white cell count was very low. You know, luckily I didn't catch any infections or anything, um, but I was may maybe two weeks away from death, basically, if I hadn't gotten into the hospital when I did. Um, so, aplastic anemia has, at least back then, I think the treatments have advanced since then, but back then there was two options. There was bone marrow transplant, that was option number one. And so they, they tested all of my siblings and my parents and none of them were compatible donors, so option number one was out. Um, and so option number two 
was a very experimental treatment at the time. I think it was maybe four years old at the time. Um, the treatment that they decided to use was called anti-phimocyclobulin, aka it's called ATG for short. And basically what it is, it's, it is serum extracted from the blood of a horse and you are fed that serum in these big old bottles <laughs> um, twice a day for eight days, like four hours at a time. Okay, so success rate, according to my doctor, was about 40-60, which means I have basically a 40% chance of getting back to my, to health, you know, uh, to living a normal life. Um, so, young, 17 years old, I'm thinking I'll be all right. You know, I'm, I'm in the hospital doing push-ups, doing sit-ups. Uh, you know, I'm visualizing, hurtling in my sleep. You know, so as soon as I can get out of here, I get back on the track and get at it. Um, so I was very naive as to just how far gone I was. You know, um, so the treatment lasted eight days, as I said, and one of my doctors, one of my younger doctors, uh, not Dr. Schwartz said uh, that once the treatment's over, I would feel a lot better. Because the treatment was hell. There's so many uh, side effects and they were brutal, they were severe. Um, and it just kind of, it kind of ruined my whole perspective. I went from doing crunches and sit-ups and stuff to just laying there, not knowing what was going to happen, you know. So I was hoping, based on what that doctor had told me, that by day nine, I'd be all right. You know, I'd start feeling better again. But the morning of the ninth day, I felt worse than I had ever felt any of the previous days. And I just laid up, I sat up in my bed, and I just kind of laid there and bawled. I just cried um, because I, the thing about it was, I was more afraid that I would never hurdle again than, I, than, that, I would, than that I would die. That's the thought that made me really cry, you know. When I thought to myself, you know, Steve, you have a life-threatening blood disease, you're not going to hurdle again. <laughs> You're not getting back on that track. You, you gotta be realistic here, you know. And when that thought hit me, I just gushed tears. And fortunately, my nurse came in. She actually came in to check on my roommate to see, you know, give him his vital signs and whatnot. And then she saw me over there crying, so she came over to me, you know, and asked me what was wrong. And I said, I'm done. Her name was Meg. And I said, Meg, I'm done. I'm never going to run the hurdles again. And she grabbed me by, grabbed my hands and put her hands in my, in it. I mean, my hands and hers, and she told me, yes, you will. You will run again. And, you know, it was one of those beautiful moments in life, you know, where because she said I would run again, I believed that I would. And I got past that crisis <laughs> because she was there and she cared. Um, and so she left um, and promised she'd be back soon. And so while she was gone, I pulled out my book bag that I brought with me, you know, and I took out a index card and a pencil and I wrote, Dear Meg, I thank God you are alive. I needed a friend and you were there. And I waited for her to come back. And when she came back, um, I handed her the note and she started crying. And we were crying there together. Um, and I looked back at that moment as, you know, the moment when I knew I would run again and that I would be okay. Um, I didn't know how it would work out, I just knew that it would work out. Um, and that's the power of someone infusing you with their faith in you and their trust and their strength. Um, so anyway, um, I left the hospital about a week after the treatment was over and I was at home for another two weeks before I returned to school. During those two weeks I did start running again. <laughs> I did start running again. I did a half mile about three days after I got out of the hospital. And a half mile was farther than I had been able to run before I left the hospital, so I was ecstatic. I got, as soon as I finished the half mile, I ran inside and called my coach. <laughs> that was the most beautiful, blissful half mile I have ever run. Um, and I was kept going back for weekly checkups, and my blood counts were rising, rising, rising. Um, by January, so I got, out of, I got out of the hospital end of November, right before Thanksgiving. And less than a full two months later, uh, in January, I was told that my blood counts were high enough that I was out of the danger zone and I could run again. And I started training with my teammates and about another month later I was told that my blood counts were normal. And so, what you have to understand is that, um, let me put it this way, let me put it how my doctor put it to me. 
Our doctor told me that, he told me this later, I didn't know this at the time, that for severe aplastic anemia, which is what I had, um, very few people survive at all. Um, and for those who do, very few, even in a smaller percentage, get to the point where the blood counts are normal again and they don't have to come in for checkups on a regular basis. Okay. Um, and there's even a smaller percentage of people who make a full recovery within a year. I mean, that, that's, that's the uh, best case scenario. Your blood counts after the ATG treatment, your blood counts are back to normal within a year. So mine were back to normal within three months, and I finished my senior year. I returned to track. I won the 110s, the 110 hurdles in our league championship, and I was considered a hero by my coaches and my peers, you know. Um, and so I look back on that whole experience, and I say that um, it, it really did shape my life. Every time ever since then, I've walked away from the hurdles, I've ended up walking back. You know, when I finished my college career, I, didn't, I thought I was done with hurdles, you know, 15, 6, 58, you know, peace. <laughs> um, but I ended up coaching, you know. I didn't think I was going to be that heavily involved in coaching. I, I was an English major, and I, and I went to grad school for English. I got a master's in English, so I was trying to be an English teacher. But, you know, everything works out for me as a hurdle story. So, you know, I ended up going to a school where I could coach and then I got involved with uh, youth track clubs and whatnot. And, you know, I started this website because I like the hurdles and I like to write, you know. So the hurdles have always been at the forefront. They've always been a key part of my story. And that's what I want you to consider um, as you listen to my story is, what is your story in, in relation to the hurdles? And, I think that everybody's story is important, everybody's story matters, everybody's story can inspire others. Um, so, you know, we have a place on our website, the personal stories link on the main page, where you can submit your story and share it with other hurdlers and hurdle people who can gain something from your experiences. So I encourage you to take part in that uh, to as much of a degree as you feel comfortable doing. Okay, so. Um, that's the end of Hurdle Talk number one. I uh, hope you enjoy it and see you next time. Thank you.